In this video, we're going to talk about securities markets and transactions uh, when we're investing and how those work. So let's get right started with looking at securities markets. The, the goal of the market, quite frankly, is to provide a place. It's a place where transactions can be made quickly and they can be made at a fair price. So this again is just a place that allows buyers and sellers to get together. Uh, essentially, it is the point of the supply and demand mechanism. And again, we're in this uh, piece, we're going to talk about several different aspects. We're going to talk about the types of markets, how the brokers and stock dealers work. We'll talk about some other kinds of systems, and then we'll talk about some general market conditions. So the types of securities markets, and there's really a couple of ways we can talk about this. The first way we talk about really is related to time. Um, and this really has nothing really to do with investment per se, but this particular way just says, look, there are things that are defined as short term. Short term meaning they have a life at issue less than one year. So the money market is all those short term things that have at the very beginning when they're initially issued, they all have a uh, lifespan at that point of less than one year. The capital market then is everything else. So the everything else essentially boils down to being stocks and bonds. Uh, most everything else that you can think of um, are really very short term types of things. Now I'm sure you're well aware the Securities and Exchange Commission, that's the federal agency that's in charge of regulating the securities markets. And there's lots of questions uh, over the last 5, 10, 15 years as to whether or not they can actually get the job done since there's been uh, uh, there have been some scandals, there have been some uh, um, irregularities, if you will, in the marketplace from time to time. So regulation is always a question. But another way to think about the markets is to think not about the time of issue at issue, but to think about the sale, right? When, when, when the security is sold, what do we, what kind of market is that? And this really breaks down into two markets, two fundamental markets, I guess. The primary market, we'll talk about this first, this is when the security is first issued. The secondary market, we'll talk about that later, the secondary market is every time it trades after the first time. So the primary market has its own rules because the seller, if you will, in quotes, is the company or the government issuing the security. The secondary market has a different set of rules because in the secondary market, it's one investor is trading with another investor. There are also, there's something called the third and fourth market. We'll mention those a little bit later, but of primary importance in the investment community is the understanding of these two uh, concepts of primary and secondary. So the primary market, one of the things that we find in this market is what's referred to as an initial public offering. It's the first time that this security has been sold to the public. So there have been a lot of these recently. Uh, Uber has recently um, uh, gone through an IPO. Um, I believe Lyft has gone through an IPO or they're in the process. But we've had lots of them. Almost any company that trades has gone through an initial public offer. Yeah, I, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> at least once in its life when it was initially went uh, went public. So there's three ways that this can happen through something called a public offering. This is where securities are offered for sale to public investors. There's also something called a rights offering. And this is when the share is ex offered to existing shareholders 
on a pro rata basis. Now this is not really the way an initial public offering works, right? Because we don't have public shareholders right now. A private placement is when securities are sold directly to a select group of private uh, investors. So the initial public offering is going to happen under one of these first categories, if you will. If a company already has stock, let, let's say that P&G wanted to issue more shares, they would issue more shares. It would be in a primary market, in quotes, but it would be under what's referred to as a rights offering because they already have shareholders. So the shareholders get the right to buy um, their, or their controlling interest in the company. So the basic process, one, the first thing is something called underwriting. This is the promotion of the stock that helps facilitate, right, to get the word out that this stock is now available to be purchased. A prospectus is a document that describes the issue. There is something referred to as a quiet period. There's a time between when the prospectus is actually filed and when the company can start talking about the security, right? So in the pre-registration part, while the SEC is reviewing the document, the company is not allowed to talk about this share, right? Or the issue, it's, it's, they have to be quiet. Now at the end of that, That is when the company can now they can start really advertising that this thing is out and available. So the red herring is a prospectus, but it's preliminary, right? You can provide this uh, preliminary perspective to investors. However, every page on this document is going to be um, it's going to be um, stamped with the word primary, right, or preliminary. So that you know that what you're looking at, it's not official, right? So until you get the actual official prospectus, this is just giving you some information about what might be coming. And of course, there's always a roadshow, right? We have to market this to investors, and that's the, the last part of this IPO process. Now, let's think about how this share actually gets marketed to investors corporations and the government they don't have anybody on staff that knows how to do this because quite frankly especially with stocks it doesn't happen that often that the company issues shares of stock so we need to have somebody that knows what's going on somebody that has the expertise so it is outsourced and it's outsourced to an investment banker this is just a company that helps with advice and helps with marketing. So their underwriting, in quotes, underwriting job, right, is they're going to purchase the security from the company at a, an agreed upon price, and then they bear the risk for selling it to the public. Uh, if it's a very large issue, sometimes they'll ask for some help to kind of diversify things away and create the syndicates and to create a selling group, right? The compensation that they typically receive is, is based as a percentage or a discount on the sale price. So maybe their compensation is, you know, they sell it for $100 and they have a 5% discount. So, uh, you know, if they can sell it for 100 bucks, they're gonna make $5 for each share that's distributed. Um, there is a video that I would suggest if you have time, if you want to go out and, and watch. Um, it's a very good explaining how the investment banking thing works. So now let's switch to the secondary market. Again, this is where investors are trading with investors. The market goals here or the, the function of the market here is to provide liquidity. Right? It has to provide a way for you to very quickly trade your shares. It also provides this pricing mechanism. It provides the place where people go to uh, bring together the supply and demand curves, if you will. So the major segments of this 
is we have the national securities exchanges. These are buildings, places where people work, right? And we have what's referred to as the over-the-counter market, typically for smaller, although not necessarily smaller, but this over-the-counter market is more of a computerized network than people interacting with each other face-to-face. So there are two kinds of markets, if you will. A broker market, this consists of the national and regional securities exchanges. When uh, trades are executed, they're brought together by a broker and the trade takes place directly between the buyer and the seller. Now, really not through, it's really their agents, but this is what happens at the New York Stock Exchange. A person calls their broker and says, I wanna buy 100 shares of P&G. That broker calls his main office up on Wall Street. That company then gives information to a trader that's on the floor. That trader goes and finds out where P&G is being sold and they go and make the, make the trade for the investor. Now the dealer market, this is really made up of the NASDAQ exchange. And really this is when it is traded over a computer system. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's the dealer in this case kind of acts like a middle person, if you will. So uh, again, there's a set price, right? And the, the market maker here, the person that's creating the sales, offer securities uh, to be bought. And of course they buy back and uh, securities that want to be sold. So if you kind of look at the deal, the markets, the left hand side are the brokers. Those are physical things. The right hand side, the dealer markets are more computerized things. Now, can a broker also do dealer market things? Well, if you have an exchange, if you go to fifth third and you want to buy stock at fifth third they may have that stock on inventory if you will so they can sell it right from their inventory in that case they'd be acting as a dealer not a broker so the broker markets as we mentioned they're the national exchanges right they're the exchanges where they're buildings Um, the new york stock exchange is the largest exchange Uh, Recently, there was a merger between the New York Stock Exchange and the American Exchange. Uh, There are also some regional exchanges. There are also exchanges for options and futures. So again, these are places where people go uh, and and trades occur. Now, dealer markets, again, I mentioned, there's no centralized trading floor. This is a computerized network. And there are two prices. And if you look up a stock on Yahoo Finance, you'll see these prices listed. There's the bid price. This is the highest price offered to purchase a given security. I kind of, this is a little confusing to more, so let me come back and I'll give you my rationale for how 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 this makes sense to me. The ask price then is the lowest price offered to sell a given security. Let's, that is speaking from the, um, that is speaking from the perspective of the broker. Let's think about the investor, right? You're going to buy stock at the retail price. If you sell stock back, you're selling stock to the broker, and the broker is, in quotes, putting that in inventory, so you pay the, you will receive the wholesale price when you um, sell when you uh, sell the stock back to the brokerage, right? So the retail price is the price you buy at. The wholesale price is the price that you sell at. Now there is a profit that the company makes. Just like any other retail operation, if you take, it's called the bid-ask spread. If you take the ask price, the retail price, and you subtract the bid price, That's the profit that the broker makes on the trade. Again, we talked, they say it includes mostly smaller companies. Uh, Quite frankly, that's not necessarily true. Um, In the NASDAQ, which is the the overall index, there are lots of very big companies in there, but there's lots of companies that trade on this computerized network. 
you can choose to be there. Uh, there are also some that are um, not re readily traded, if you will, or not a actively traded. And those down below here are the OTC pink markets. These are unregulated, very small, risky companies. QB, right? These guys have to provide uh, some reporting and they have to be current with their disclosures, but they're very small. Uh, QX, these are companies that choose to provide audited statements, right? So again, these companies, how they fit in here, they're typically very small companies. Uh, so uh, uh, most investors are not going to be interested in those very, very small kinds of companies. There are some alternate tr trading uh, markets, if you will. Uh, there's a third market. These are OTC markets uh, that are made uh, for securities that are in the New York Stock Exchange or another exchange. So again, large institutional investors might go through market makers that are not members of the exchange, right? It's just cheaper, it's quicker. Um, institutional investors might get uh, reduced trading costs because of the size of their transactions. So again, they may participate in what's called this third market. And the fourth market, again, this is, they're made through a computerized network rather than an exchange. But then this is directly between large institutional buyers and sellers. So one man, money manager of one mutual fund may sell some directly to a money manager of another one. Again, the idea here is ultimately is to save some money and reduce the overall trading expenses of managing uh, large portfolios. And then, and last, just to, to, to get us start to now thinking of the investment world, you know that there are two kinds of ways to consider the market as far as its performance. A bull market is when we typically have security markets rising. Investor optimism is up. It's an economic recovery. Maybe there's some kind of government stimulus that's going on. When prices are rising, we typically think of that as being a bull market. Now you have a bull market for stocks and you can have a bull market for bonds. They don't happen typically at the same time. And of course, a bear market is just the opposite. When things are moving down, what do we expect to have? Prices are falling. Investors are becoming more and more pessimistic. Maybe we have an economic slowdown. Something's happened in the government that's trying to restrain transactions and, and the economy. So again, that is, uh, that is the end of part one.